Okay, well, let's start with prayer. My favorite prayer is the Holy Spirit prayer. I take it enough. Figure we need the Holy Spirit. Yes. This is going to sink in. So let's, let's pray the Holy Spirit prayer. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy, Holy Spirit. Spirit. Amen. Amen. Come, Holy, Holy Spirit, Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful, and, and kindle them in the, land, the fire of your love. Send forth your Spirit, and they shall be created, and you shall renew the face of the earth. O God, who by the light of the Holy Spirit instructs the hearts of the faithful, grant that by the same Holy Spirit they may be truly wise and ever rejoice in his consolations. Through Christ our Lord, amen. In the name of the Father and the Son. Okay, well, welcome to our study on the Gospel according to Matthew. Uh, this is a statue of uh, St. Matthew in St. John Lateran in Rome. Of course, nobody knows what these guys look like. So in artwork, they always put something with the person to give it away. So, what objects do you see here? Explain why they're there. What objects? The book is the, is the big one. Okay, well... So what is the book? Well, if, if you zoom in, it doesn't say what the book is. But Matthew relied heavily on the Old Testament. They think he was probably, he may have been a rabbi or an Old Testament scholar. So one thought is that, because you, when, when you read Matthew, you'll see always he's referencing according to the Old Testament. So one thought is, well, there's, it's depicting him as, as, the, as the student of the Old Testament. Uh, the other possibility is, uh, as we'll talk about later, they think that one of the sources that Matthew used for his gospel was the gospel of Mark. So possibly he's studying the gospel of Mark. Okay, that's that's the big, and there's another smaller image down near the bottom. He's stepping on something there. I don't, I don't have a blow up of that. But it looks like a money bag with coins falling out. Okay. Right. Oh, I see that. Yeah. One and, yeah. Traditionally, Matthew was the tax collector. And in a sense, he's kind of like, you know, stepping on his old profession, maybe rejecting his old profession and focusing on the scripture. And just to give you some perspective, these statues are huge. This is the a picture inside St. John Ladder, and over here is, is the statue. And you kind of get a, get a sense of the size of it, like there's a person. So it's probably over 20 feet. And all these statues are the same way. And if you ever get to Rome, you do just such treasures there. So a little contact information for me. My name, Joe Sosnowski. My wife, you mentioned you coming in. I hope. My email, my phone number. I have a web page, not much there, but it's a link to other things. I have a YouTube channel. I post a variety of things there. I have a podcast. I post a variety of things there. I'm on Facebook. If you're on Facebook and you want to like me, send me a like. Mm-hmm. Any question, I will accept. And the last thing is, uh, I plan to post these lectures on, on the St. Damien website. So that's the link. I emailed everybody whose email I had, so you can just click on that, and I'll be posting that. So within a couple of days, hopefully, I'll post a lecture. You know, so if you miss a lecture, or you want to go back and fact check me, it'll be there. So we're going to meet today. We'll meet next Monday. We're going to be off the following Monday, because Jean and I are going down to Washington for a couple of days for the March for Life. And then we'll we meet again the, the uh, first two uh, Mondays in February. Most of you have heard this, but not everybody. Just a little bit about my background. I'm retired, and I taught scripture classes both in parish levels and also for the diocese. Uh, as I repro- approach retirement, I was teaching these classes and wanted to get a little more grounded in that. So I went to LaSalle, I got a master's in theology, and I kind of focused on scripture. I took all the scripture courses I could get. Uh, so that's a little bit of my background and why I'm here and, you know, um, why I really want to share this because it's like a passion for me to do this and I really enjoy it. Okay, and so this would be lecture, but generally it's an open lecture, so I kind of depend on conversation as we go. So if something bothers you or you have a question, you know, we'll just go off on a tangent and see where that goes. Okay, and, and if something comes up that we can't resolve, I mean, I'll take one on my list and we can... We can take a look at it next week. Right? I did send some questions out, and I'm hoping to do that just to give you some thought, you know, something to think about when you're reading the scriptures. So here's the outline for this class. I'll do an introduction, a little bit of introduction to biblical basics, and then we'll do the the uh, 
infancy narratives and Jesus' preparation for the mission. So first, we're doing the first four chapters. Uh, any Bible is good. I mean, that, and I said, that's what's your text? The text is the Bible. Right? We can, we're going to focus on the Bible. We're not going to have... Uh, there's plenty of commentaries, and if you want a recommendation on commentaries, see me after class, and I can give you some good recommendations. But the Bible is the document that we're going to be using. And the one that I recommend, if you're going to get one, is the New American Bible. But that doesn't mean you can't use other ones. But if you're going to get a Bible, and if you have it, this is the one to use, the New American Bible. And the reason for that is this is the one, this is the translation that they use at Mass. So you'll be hearing you know, this translation when you go to church on Sunday. So that's one of the main reasons. Uh, the reason I have this symbol up, uh, the Gospel of Matthew has a distinctive Jewish flavor. So the image that I've chosen to represent Matthew's Gospel is the Jewish seven candle menorah. And this, and it's just an image to, to kind of capture this idea in your head, hopefully, of the Jew, it's a Jewishness, because you're going to be seeing a lot of Jewish uh, influences in, in the Gospel of Matthew. Okay, so let me do some Bible basics. Matthew is the first book, first book of the seven, of the twenty-seven books of the New Testament. The way to remember the number twenty-seven, if you want to, is to think of the Trinity, New Testament Trinity. We have three persons, right? If you, if you take three times three, three times three times three is twenty-seven. Uh, and the Gospels, the four Gospels, are the core of the New Testament. And they give us four perspectives on the life and ministry of Jesus. And again, they are the core of the New Testament. And each each evangelist perspective is slightly different uh, because they were addressing different audiences and they were trying to make different theological points. But the beauty is if you take them as a whole, you're going to get the whole picture of Jesus. So in addition to the Gospels, we have uh, the book of Acts, which is a story of the church for approximately the first 20 years after Jesus' ascension. And then we have the letters. And then finally the book of Revelation. And over here is the order. So the Gospels are first. Oh, then you have the Acts of the Apostles. And then you have the letters. These are all the letters that are attributed to Paul. So Paul gets his letters listed first. And they're listed by order of length. So Romans is the longest, oh, so on down. Oh, Hebrews is an exception. Okay, because Hebrews, all of a sudden you get a Philemon, which I think is only one chapter, and all of a sudden you got Hebrews. <laughs> blows up again. And then finally, these are the other letters, and again, we end with the book of Revelation. So why Matthew? Well, first I said the Gospels are the core of the New Testament, and we would say the core of the Bible. The other reason is that the, the church goes through a three-year liturgical cycle. So during cycle A, which is this year, you'll hear primarily from the Gospel of Matthew during ordinary time, and we're in ordinary time now. So during this liturgical year, and the liturgical year goes from uh, the feast of the first Sunday of Advent until the feast of Christ the King. Right, so we're in liturgical year A. You'll be hearing primarily from Matthew. So that's one. That's really the reason I picked it because that's what we'll be hearing from this year. Uh, cycle B, they feature Mark's Gospel. Cycle C, they feature Luke's Gospel, and then John kind of fills in on special occasions, especially during the, the, the non-ordinary time liturgical seasons. Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Matthew, Mark, and Luke are called the Synoptic Gospels, and that comes from a Greek word meaning you can kind of see them with one eye. They kind of follow the same line. They have the same order. You can, you can line them up side by side, and you can compare mm -hmm. verses. Right? Not totally. And there's been books, you know, there's books where they do exactly that. This is one, the synopsis of the four Gospels, where they'll line the, God, the synoptic Gospels up, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, because they follow the same storyline, and you can see how they're very similar. And this is also very interesting. Uh, mm -hmm. Jerry said about reading different Bibles. Well, if you read the same story in different mm -hmm. in the different Gospels, you'll get different perspectives too. They put John in here, but John doesn't really fit into the pattern. He he's not one of the synoptic Gospels. He kind of follows a different pattern, a different flow of storyline. 
Now, scholars have studied the synoptic gospel's similarities, primarily similarities and differences, and have concluded from that study that Matthew is probably not the first gospel written. Traditionally, again, these, the, this order, which is uh, probably goes back to some of the first centuries, this order originally was the order that they thought they were written. Right? Mm-hmm. Modern scholarship has concluded that's probably not the case, that Matthew was not the first written, that it was Mark. All right, a little bit of, little bit of biblical theory. And the theory that explains this interconnection between the Synoptic Gospels is called the two-source theory. All right, so for most of church history, it was assumed that the Gospels were written in the order that they appear in the Bible so that each subsequent evangelist used the previous gospel as a source for when he was writing his gospel. So we had, traditionally it was Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. And it wasn't until the 1800s and the beginning of modern biblical scholarship that this relationship between the gospels was seriously questioned. So Mark, Mark is the shortest gospel, and most of Mark is repeated in Matthew and Luke. So the thinking was that Mark was written first and both Matthew and Luke used Mark as a literary source when they wrote their Gospels. Right. The second source that scholars have identified is a source they call Q, which does not, you know, it's no longer existent. They can't find it, but they believe it existed at one point because there's 235 verses that Matthew and Luke have that are not in Mark. So they're saying that must have come from some other source, which is called Q, so just looking specifically at Matthew, so Matthew has a total of over 1,000 verses. 600 of them are from the Gospel of Mark, which has 661. So most of Mark is repeated in Matthew. And then 235 from this Q source, and then 233 from some other source. Another feature that supports the theory that Mark is the earliest is that when, when sometime when the verses are repeated, like sometime when Mark's verses are repeated in Matthew, there's slight changes that kind of give evidence of, of some theological development, like mm-hmm. later theological development. So I'll give you an example. Uh, I'm going to read Mark. We'll look at Mark, and then we'll see what Matthew does with this. Okay. Uh, and, the Mark, and the verses uh, we're going to read are Mark uh, chapter 1, verse 4 and 5, and 9 to 11. In fact, does somebody want to do that? And this is this is the story that we heard on Sunday, Jesus' baptism in the Jordan. Now, we heard Matthew's version. We're going we're gonna to read Mark's version. John the Baptist appeared in the desert proclaiming a baptism of repentance for forgiveness of sins. People of the whole Judean countryside and all the inhabitants of Jerusalem were going out to him and were being baptized by him in the Jordan River as they acknowledged their sins. And then what, 9 to 11? 9 to 11, right. It happened in those days that Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized in the Jordan by John. On coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens being torn open and the Spirit, like a dove, descending upon him. And a voice came from the heavens, You are my beloved Son. With you, I am well So, the question, theological question that might be asked is, John was baptizing for the forgiveness and repentance of sins, right? Jesus is God and is sinless, so why would Jesus need to be baptized? Uh, you can see that mm-hmm. theological question being asked. So now let's read Matthew chapter 3, verses 13 to 17. The baptism of Jesus. Then Jesus came from Galilee to John at the Jordan to be baptized by him. John tried to prevent him, saying, I need to be baptized by you, and yet you are coming to me. Jesus said to him in reply, Allow it now, for thus it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he allowed him. After Jesus was baptized, he came up from the water. And behold, the heavens were opened for him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and coming upon him. And a voice came from beyond the heavens, saying, This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. So when Matthew tells the story, he seems to address this question about 
Jesus as being sinless, and why is he being baptized? Because we hear John objecting, saying, I shouldn't do this. You didn't hear that in Mark. And then Jesus insisting, and Jesus in this case gives a reason. He said, let it be so for now, for thus it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. What that means is to be righteous is to do the right thing, to do God's will, to be obedient to God. So it was an act of obedience to God. Mm -hmm. The general consensus is that Mark was the first gospel written. Right, and written somewhere between the year, get over here, you can see this timeline, 65 and 70. And then Matthew and, and Luke had his gospel as a source for them, and they wrote the gospel sometime between 70 and 90. And then John was the last one written uh, sometime after 90. And most of what you read in the synoptic gospels is not repeated in John. And people speculate, well, why? And one of the thoughts is that at that point, these Gospels had been out for several decades. And the thinking is, people, John figured people are familiar with these stories. And I'm going to give a different theological perspective on this. Uh, so he didn't repeat most of the stories. That's one theory. So in the year 70 is a very significant year for the Jews and Christians. Because in year 70, 70 the Romans put down a Jewish rebellion that was instigated by the Jewish zealots, and the Romans destroyed the temple. This is a catastrophic event for the Jews and for the Christians. Uh, and partly the dating of the Gospels is based on whether the temple's destruction seems to be being predicted or it seems to have already happened. All four Gospels were written anonymously. When you read the Gospels, nowhere does it say who the author doesn't identify themselves. And the titles of the Gospel of Matthew, Mark, and Luke were added sometime in the second century. Again, traditionally the Gospel of Matthew was written by the Apostle Matthew, who was the Jewish tax collector. And Jewish tax collectors were generally looked down upon because of their, I think, well evidently well-earned reputation for being greedy. So he's kind of an outlier, but he is one of the one of the apostles. And we'll read the story of the call of Matthew in Matthew chapter 9, verses 9 to 13. When you read the similar story in the other two Gospels, his name is Levi, but scholars pretty much think this is the same person. Mm -hmm. Maybe he had, was called by two different names. Of course, scholars now debate whether it was actually the Apostle or somebody writing the Apostles and using the Apostle's name. There's no way, no way really to settle that question. But scholars do agree that the Gospel of Matthew, the author, was a Jewish Christian and he was well versed in the Hebrew Scriptures because he refers extensively to them in his Gospel. Uh, this is Caravaggio's painting of the Call of Matthew. Have you ever, see, have you ever seen this before, the Call of Matthew? Yeah. When painters paint these images, they paint it within the culture that they're living in. They're, they're not trying to, they're not even trying to make it look like what Jesus looked like back then. So this would be Jesus pointing to Matthew, and here's Matthew, you can, you can identify Matthew again by what you see here, he's like looking down, counting his money, right? you can see this guy saying, you know, him? That guy you're calling him? Uh, so Matthew's community, um, he was writing to a primarily Jewish Christian audience, the Jewish Christians considered themselves as Jews whose Messiah Jesus had come. So, in the early church, they would worship in the temple or the synagogue and then break bread at home. And act, in fact, in Acts, we read, every day they devoted themselves to meeting in the temple area and to breaking bread in their homes. So, you see the, the early structure of the Mass, right? You have the liturgy of the Word followed by the liturgy of the Eucharist. Uh, and, but eventually, a split occurred sometime after the destruction of the temple, and Matthew was probably written around that time or afterward, afterward, after there was actual split between the Jews and the Christians. Before that, again, the Jewish Christians considered themselves as a Jewish sect, where the true Jews are Messiah's here. That didn't continue, unfortunately. Now, there's really no way to know where Matthew's community 
was located. But scholars have a general consensus that it was probably Antioch in Syria. At the time of the early church, it was a, ver- a flourishing Christian community. In the book of Acts, after the martyrdom of Stephen in Jerusalem, some disciples fled to Jerusalem and fled Jerusalem and went to Antioch. And they were so successful that they had to bring in the converted Paul to help them with the community. I want to give you a little bit of historical background on this split that occurred between the Jews and the Christians. So around year 65, the Jewish people revolted, the Zealots revolted against the Romans, and the Romans suppressed the revolt, and in the year 70 destroyed the temple. And this is one artist's depiction of the Roman siege of Jerusalem. And after they were done, the only thing left was the western wall, or the Wailing Wall, which still exists today. So that's, that was the only thing that left back in the first century and is still in existence today. At the time of Jesus, there were two main Jewish sects. One was the Sadducees, and they were the priests. They were the temple priests, and the other were the Pharisees. So when the temple was destroyed, this put the, the Sadducees out of business because they were the priests, they offered the sacrifices, and the sacrifices could only be offered in the temple. So they were basically out of business. Also, the temple was integral to the Jewish identity of who they were as a people. They revolved around the temple. So without the temple, without the priesthood class, without the sacrificial system, this has been described as identity crisis for the Jews. You know, what does it now mean to be a Jew? You know, who, is, who is a true Jew? And to answer that question, or to help resolve that question, the Pharisees, who were the remaining religious leaders left, because they weren't, they weren't uh, centered in the temple, they had a conference in Jamnia, which is in, in the Palestine, where they tried to settle some of these issues. And one of the things they were trying to settle, and did settle, is who's in, who's out. Who are the true Jews, and who are the heretics? And they decided that these Christian Jews, they're out, they're heretics. And they added a blessing, which is really a curse, against heretics, and specifically mentioned to Christians. This is the blessing of heretics. It's called a blessing, but it's really a curse. Right? And this is one translation. And, and, this, and this blessing would be part of what they would read when they gathered in their synagogues. So, for the apostates, let there be no hope, and let the arrogant government be speedily uprooted in our days. Let the Nazorim, and that's a word for Nazarenes, which was understood to be Christians, because Jesus was from Nazareth, the Nazarenes, and the Minim, and that's a technical word for heretics, so they're lumping in the Christians with the heretics, be destroyed in a moment, and let them be blotted out of the book of life, and not be inscribed together with the righteous. Best are thou, O Lord, who humblest the arrogant. So the Christians had a dilemma, right? I mean, they, now they basically couldn't, they couldn't say this prayer, so they couldn't go to the synagogue, and that really precipitated the split. Mm-hmm. Okay. okay, the structure of Matthew. Uh, traditionally, the Gospel of Matthew consists of five major books patterned after the Torah. The Torah is the first five books of the, of the Old Testament, and it's the core of the Old Testament. And each book consists of a of a narrative storyline and a discourse or a sermon. And each of these discourses or sermon ends with the word, and this is one of the markers that they scholars see, ends with the word, when Jesus finished these words, or some similar expression. Uh, and then Matthew frames these five books with two bookends. The infancy narratives at the beginning, and the passion and resurrection narratives at the end. One way, to, one way to picture this structure is the seven branch menorah, and that's why uh, this is typically the image that are, is presented. Um, and, I, and I have a little one here. When we were in Israel, I bought a menorah. I got a little one because the big ones were very expensive. You pass that around. But I'll hopefully, get, put an image in your head uh, to help you under, help you remember the structure. So again, the seven branch menorah. So you had the five books plus the two bookends, right? Five, five imaging are representing the Torah, the core of the Jewish faith, right? and the two bookends give seven, which is also very interesting, because seven is a 
significant number, biblical number. Seven is the number of perfection. So if you have seven of something, you have everything you need. You don't need the eight. But if you only have six, you're missing something. So seven is a biblical number representing perfection. And I, I was thinking, well, one example from our Christian faith is our seven sacraments. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, the church went through a whole period where they were trying to figure out, well, how many do we have? And it was concluded, well, we have seven, six, we're missing something, eight, we don't need. Right? So seven is the perfect, we have all the sacraments we need. The seven branch menorah goes back to the time of Moses, which is about 1200 B.C., and, it, and it's of course with the directions given to Moses on Mount Sinai for building of the temple. Versus there's a nine branch menorah that the Jewish people used to celebrate the Feast of Hanukkah. And that, and that was from the time of the Maccabees, which is about 200 BC. And that celebrated, it was, I guess, uh, the miracle of the nine days when they didn't run out of oil when they were trying to light the candles. So you see two, two different menorahs. The one we're using here goes back to Mount Sinai. There are other structures, and I'll just mention one. I, this is not in your uh, handout, I don't think. Uh, this is called a chiastic structure. So you have, we call it A narratives, or somehow counterbalanced with A narratives down here. So somehow, chapters 1 to 4, you see like an image or a counterbalance of that. In chapters uh, uh, 26 to 28, and then B would be counterbalanced with B, C with C, and so on. And they look at things like, well, there's the length of the Gospels, the subject of the Gospels, the length of the chapters, the subject of the chapters, and they see similarities. Uh, as an example of that is, uh, in these chapters, you see the blessings for true disciples, counterbalanced with the woes for false disciples. And typically, one of the purposes of this is to kind of highlight and point to this, the center one. And the center, and taking this, the center of that would be that's the, that's the chapter that has all the parables of the kingdom. So the kingdom of God is light. The kingdom of God is light. There's other structures. And I guess the, the, uh, the point I'm trying to make is that Matthew was very thoughtful and organized. So there are the uh, five major books uh, and the two bookends. And these are the... Uh, so this is the title that your New American Bible gives for these. So when you go in your Bible, uh, these are the... the headings for the various sections that they put in. So in Matthew, as in the other Synoptic Gospels, right, we said Synoptic Gospels are Matthew, Mark, and Luke because they follow the same storyline. Jesus' public ministry is primarily in Galilee, so he starts his public ministry in Galilee, and at the end of his ministry, he travels south to Jerusalem for his passion, death, and resurrection. And it's always, when, when they talk about going to Jerusalem, they always say going they always go up to Jerusalem. Right? Because, two reasons. First of all, Jerusalem is actually on a plateau. It's, I think, 2,500 feet high versus the Sea of Galilee, which I think is minus 700 feet. And the Dead Sea is, let's see, 1,400 feet below sea level. So you're always going physically up. But also, when you go to see God, you go up to see God. Right? God's on the mountain, typically. So you're always going up. So the major themes, and there's a lot of ways to parse this, but the, some of the major themes, or two of the major themes in the Gospel of Matthew are Christology and Ecclesiology. So Christology, Christology is a term for the study of the person of Jesus. So it's who is Jesus? And Matthew demonstrates that Jesus is the Messiah because he fulfills the Old Testament prophecies about the Messiah. And 30, and there may be more actual quotes, and I give you that handout just for your interest actual allusions to an actual they actually quote the Old Testament uh, in the Gospel of Matthew. So he's the Messiah in fulfilling the Old Testament prophecies. He's also the superior Moses. So Moses is the lawgiver, premier lawgiver from the Old Testament. But Matthew wants to present Jesus as the authoritative teacher and interpreter of the law. Moses interpreting the Old Testament, he's presenting Jesus as doing that in a superior way because he's the Messiah. We'll see next week, this is exactly what he does in the Sermon on the Mount. Ecclesiology is the study of the church, that's us. So what does it mean to be a member of Jesus' church, or what does it mean to be a disciple of Jesus? So how are we, the church, unique from any other organization or group of people? 
And one of the prime answers to that is our uniqueness as a church can be seen in our obedience to the law of Jesus. And we're going to hit the law of Jesus next week. It's the Sermon on the Mount. So the church, we, and the church should be a living example of Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. So today we're going to cover the first four chapters of Matthew. Uh, chapter 1 and 2, Genealogy genealogy of Jesus, the infancy narratives, and then chapter 3 and 4, baptism by, by John the Baptist, his temptation in the desert, and then his public ministry begins. Chapter 1. Matthew starts his gospel with the genealogy of Jesus. The whole New Testament starts with the genealogy. But it's, uh, there are some interesting things in there that I'm going to pull out. A verse, chapter 1, verse 1 reads, The book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, and the son of Abraham. So in this opening verse, we get three titles for Jesus, which is actually itself a title because Jesus means Yahweh is salvation. Three titles are Jesus is Christ, which is the Greek word for the Hebrew word meaning Messiah, the anointed one, someone set apart for service. Jesus is the son of David. Now God made a covenant with King David that he, King David, would have an everlasting kingdom through his descendants. And that promise, that covenant promise, is being fulfilled in Jesus. Jesus, we celebrate Christ the King. Jesus is an everlasting King. Uh, he's the son of Abraham. God made a covenant promise to Abraham that there would be universal blessings through his descendants. And Jesus is the fulfillment of that covenant promise. So originally, the Jews were the chosen people. But the plan from the very beginning for Abraham, it would, it would be universal blessing. And Jesus ushers that in. Now everybody is included. Everybody receives the blessing. So in the genealogy, uh, Matthew traces Jesus' ancestry back to two significant people in Jewish history, Abraham and David. And in doing so, he kind of establishes Jesus' Jewish lineage. Matthew intentionally structures the genealogy in three sets of 14 generations. And he says this, so you don't have to guess what he's doing. So the first set of 14 generations starts with Abraham to King David. The second set of 14 generations from David to the Babylonian captivity. The third set of set is 14 generations from the Babylonian captivity up to the time of Jesus. Again, we see in this in number 7. In fact, we see 14 is 2 times 7. It's almost like saying not only perfection, but we got super perfection. Like saying, Amen, Amen. What seen in this symbolically God is in control. God's got the plan and the plan is unfolding perfectly. Now in the in the genealogy, what's unusual to Matthew and, and Luke also has a genealogy, but it doesn't have he doesn't include four women as Matthew does. So Matthew specifically includes four women Tamar, Rahab, Ruth, and Bathsheba in the lineage of Jesus. Uh, in that culture women were without status, without power. So Mark is kind of signaling that we're opening this up now right. even to all those, even those without power or status in their society and outsiders because at least two of them and maybe all of them were non-Jews. Rahab and Ruth were definitely non-Jewish right. and maybe the other two, it's, it's not clear. Uh, and then we'll, I'll say some of these women were of questionable character, although <laughs> in their culture they probably didn't have much of a choice. Rahab is this in Joshua 2.6. She was a prostitute in the city of Jericho. Mm -hmm. Remember when they when they crossed the Jordan and they attacked Jericho, they sent some spies in. Mm -hmm. And Rahab, she was in charge of the house, and she took them in. And she ended up being saved because of that and marrying one of the uh, one of the Jewish men, and that was in the lineage of Jesus. Uh, and then Tamar, uh, Tamar seduced her father-in-law to get an heir right, after her husband's death and has a child, and now that child is in the lineage of Jesus. And just not to let all the men off the hook, one of the men mentioned Ahaz was notorious because he practiced child sacrifice. Mm -hmm. He gave his son as a burnt offering to a pagan god. Mm -hmm. So the point most people see in this is he's trying to make the point right from the start that all, everybody, including the powerless, the outsiders, and even those with questionable backgrounds are included in the kingdom. Of course, repentance is required. So after the genealogy, we have Matthew's Annunciation story. Matthew, Joseph is the focus. Luke, Mary is the focus. So in Matthew, the Annunciation is to Joseph in a dream, not to Mary. 
You see, Joseph is the one that gets all the messages and he always gets in the dreams. Uh, so Jesus is born in Bethlehem to a Virgin Mary. And this is the church of the Nativity in Bethlehem. It's built over the site where Jesus was born. They know because these sites were kept holy from the very beginning. Mm. So that's the place. Uh, this is Jenny, by the way. The opening is the opening is back against that wall, and that's the opening to get in there. You got the extra craft on. Used to be bigger, but the men would ride in with their horses, so they blocked it off. So that's how you get in. Uh, after the Magi's visit, right? Jesus is war, or Joseph is warned in a dream that Herod will kill the child, and so Joseph takes Mary and Jesus to Egypt. And then, of course, we know that Herod orders the death of all the boys to Bethlehem two years and younger. After Herod's death, Joseph, again in a dream, says that it's safe to return. But when he learns that Herod's son, Antiochus, was now the ruler, he was afraid to go there because he was again warned in a dream. So he takes Mary and Jesus up to Nazareth. All these five events, Matt takes pains to show that they are in fulfillment of the Old Testament prophecies. So, Jesus is born of a virgin in Isaiah 7.14. To the visit of the Magi, we learned that Jesus, Jesus was born in Bethlehem, right? and that is predicted in these two Old Testament scriptures. Jesus and his family flee Egypt to fulfill uh, Hosea 11.1, 1, that the Son of God would come out of Egypt. Right? Herod's massacre of the innocents is the fulfillment of Jeremiah 31.5, where we read Rachel, Jacob's wife, is weeping for her children, the Israelites. And then when Jesus returns from Egypt, instead of going to Bethlehem, he goes to Nazareth to fulfill Isaiah 11.1, 1, that he shall be called a Nazarene. A little biblical navigation. I'll do this quickly. So I'm going to take one of these prophecies, the virgin birth, and use it as an example of the value of using references and footnotes. Uh, here I'm using, this is the New American Bible, uh, Matthew chapter 1, verse 18 through 23. And when his mother Mary was betrothed to Joseph, but before they lived together, he was found with child through the Holy Spirit. Joseph, her husband, since he was a righteous man, yet unwilling to expose her to shame, decided to divorce her quietly. Such was his intention, when behold, the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary, your wife, into your home, for it is through the Holy Spirit that this child has been conceived in her. She will bear a son, and you shall name him Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. And this all took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall be with child, and bear a son, and they shall call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. But the thing is, he doesn't tell you what prophet and where. But that's where your footnotes and um, references will help you, because there's a reference. If you look before that, behold, the, the virgin shall be with child, and bear a son, and they shall call him Emmanuel. Over there, 23, if you can see, there's a little letter next to it. And you will see this in your Bible if you have all the footnotes and references. There's a little K there. Typically, this list will be either at the bottom of the Bible or to the right in one of the columns. So if you see a K here, it will give you where that comes from. So you see it's Isaiah chapter 7, verses 14 from the Septuagint. And then also, you, so a lot of times you have footnotes. Or there's a footnote, and generally that's an asterisk. Footnotes are generally at the bottom, and that will give you some background on the verse you're reading. So if you have one that troubles you, chances are fair, fairly good that you'll have a footnote explaining it, because whatever questions you come up with, you're probably not the first one trying to figure it out. So Matthew, in these opening chapters, uh, demonstrates that Jesus and Christianity is rooted in Jewishness, in the genealogy, <laughs> in the, because of the fulfillment of the Old Testament prophecies and that there is a continuity from the old Jewishness to the new Christianity. Specifically, uh, Christianity's openness to all, including the powerless and outsiders, including women, by including women in Jesus' genealogy. Uh, two other examples from the infancy narratives demonstrating this openness to something new, foreigners and outsiders, are uh, the Holy Family, they flee to a foreign country for safety, and also the visit of the Magi. So again, you're seeing connecting with the Jewishness, but pointing to something new. Matthew also presents Jesus as an authoritative teacher. Moses is the premier Moses is the premier Old Testament lawgiver and teacher for the Jewish people, and Matthew identifies Jesus with Moses, 
He does this by drawing parallels between Jesus and Moses in the infancy narratives. Both of their lives are threatened by rulers, Moses by Pharaoh. Both fled their place of birth. Moses left Egypt for Midian as an adult, and Jesus was taken from Bethlehem to Egypt. Uh, the male children uh, were systematically killed by Pharaoh's decree in Egypt and Herod in Judah. Both return after the death of the ruler, Moses from Egypt, to lead the Israelites to the Exodus, their freedom from slavery, and Jesus to Nazareth and Galilee, where as Savior he would eventually free all humanity from their slavery to sin. But Jesus isn't just like Moses, because he's the Messiah. He's presented as the new superior Moses, the new superior teacher, the author authoritative teacher. So he begins his ministry around your age 30, and we get that from Luke. First thing Jesus does is to travel back to Judea, where he's baptized by John the Baptist. Immediately after his baptism, Jesus goes into the desert to be tempted. Jesus is being prepared for his mission. After the temptation, Jesus returns to Nazareth, his hometown, and then he continues on to Capernaum, uh, which will be his home base during his Galilean ministry. Chapter 3 opens with John preaching and baptizing. Verse 1 verse one says, John's appearance is the fulfillment of an Old Testament prophecy. So you're going to have that throughout the Gospel. And a voice crying out in the desert, prepare the way of the Lord, make sure his paths. So again, everything is unfolding according to God's plan. By tradition, John was baptizing in the Jordan near Jerusalem. Some think he was part of the Essene community. In Qumran, that's where they found the Dead Sea Scrolls. Matthew's use of the term heaven also points to a, a Jewishness because um, Matthew almost always uses the word the kingdom of heaven, whereas the other gospels say the kingdom of God, kind of showing the Jewish reluctance to use the word, the name God. Like we went to a synagogue in recent years and where the Instead of having the word God, they said it G with some dashes mm -hmm. after it. Mm -hmm. Jesus travels uh, to the Jordan, to near Jerusalem, to be, ba to be baptized. Um, and we talked about what's interesting is Matthew gives a reason why Jesus is being baptized. To answer the question, he's without sin. Why do you need to be baptized? And then we hear God speak from the heavens to the crowd. This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. This is a, from the painting in the Sistine Chapel of the Baptism of Jesus by John. And you see the Father, you see the Holy Spirit, you see Jesus. Over on the left, uh, that's John preaching. So he was preaching, preparing people for Jesus. And then, of course, after his baptism, then you see Jesus is preaching over here. So if you go to the Sistine Chapel, look for that one too. So immediately after Jesus' baptism, he's led by the Spirit into the desert to be tempted. And he fasts for 40 days. And this 40 days associates Jesus with Moses, who fasted for 40 days on Mount Sinai, again making the correlation with Moses. This also associates Jesus with the Jews, and they're wandering for 40 years in the desert. And Jesus faces his three temptations. And these three temptations mirror temptations that the Israelites face in the desert during their 40 years wandering and fail. They fail, <coughs> Jesus was successful in resisting the temptation. So Jesus is tempted to turn stones into bread. After the Israelites leave Egypt, they grumble against God because they didn't have food. Right? Jesus resists the temptation to miraculously create bread from stone. Quoting scripture, one does not live by bread alone, but every word that comes from the mouth of God. Second temptation, tempted to throw himself off the temple parapet because God will save him if he's the, if he's the son of God. And interesting in this one, Satan actually quotes scripture to Jesus. <laughs> right? Right? Uh, the Israelites in the desert, they quarreled and grumbled because they had no water. And Moses says to them, why do you quarrel with me? Why do you put God to the test? And this is what Jesus says to Satan, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. And Jesus refuses to put God to the test. And then third, Jesus is tempted to worship Satan in exchange for all the kingdoms of the world. Uh, when Moses was on Mount Sinai getting the Ten Commandments, what were the Israelites doing? They were constructing the, the golden calf which they worship. Right? Jesus refuses to worship Satan. The Lord your God shall you worship and him alone shall you serve. 
So Jesus, unlike Israel, resisted temptation each time quoting scripture, which some people say, well, that's, that's one of the values of trying to memorize scripture, is presented as the true Israel, the true and faithful Son of God, obedient to God's plan for salvation, which, of course, ultimately is his passion, death, and resurrection. There's a painting in the Sistine Chapel of the temptations also. Mm-hmm. All right, so after his temptation, he goes to Nazareth and moves on to Capernaum in Galilee and to begin his, begin his mission. And Capernaum is to become his home base during his Galilean ministry. The first words of Jesus as he begins his public ministry are, Repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. Does that sound familiar? Exactly what John the Baptist said. Right? You reject Jesus, you reject John, you reject John, you reject Jesus. And that's what the Jews did. Jesus calls his first disciples, Peter, Andrew, James, John. And their response to Jesus' call, we read they immediately, and like emphasize, they immediately left their boats and their father and followed him. Right? The disciples, in the disciples' response, we hear what it means to be a disciple of Jesus. Obedience and immediacy. So then, right after this, we hear Jesus start to preaching and great crowds start to come to him. And that's the end of the first narrative, setting us up for the discourse. What Matthew has done through his genealogy, infancy narratives, baptism, and temptations, is to show that Jesus is the one. He's the Messiah. He's the authoritative teacher. And in the next chapter, he's going to speak. Sermon on the Mount. So that'll be next week. Okay, next week, the Galilee mission and facing oppositions, chapters 4 to 13. So we've got a lot to cover. We have a lot more reading to do. The Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation. Amen. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Thank you, everybody. Thank Have you. a great week.